So if you recall at the end of the last time we had discussed sequential programming, some of the key concepts and some of the challenges, the pros and cons of sequential programming. Now we're going to start talking about concurrent programming and you'll see this is focusing on the situation where there's multiple threads, at least two threads, maybe more threads, and how they can run simultaneously and inter interact with each other using some combination of either shared objects, which are also known as synchronizers, and or message passing. And we'll see that some of the features that were downsides of sequential programming are overcome through the use of concurrent programming. That'll be one of the other key themes here. So let's talk about concurrent programming. So a concurrent program is a form of computing where two or more threads run simultaneously and compete for resources. The key focus there is compete for resources. What is a thread? Uh, this is a very important concept. A thread is a unit of execution for a stream of instructions that can run concurrently on one or more processor cores over its lifetime. So the point here is there's a stream of instructions. Each thread could be running perhaps a different stream of instructions, maybe the same stream of instructions. And these threads can run concurrently with respect to each other on one or more processor cores. And these are the processor cores down here. I was trying to find a way to, to show them visually so I have little, little Apple cores. A thread typically runs in the context of a process, certainly in the context of Java it does. In some older school real-time embedded operating systems, they didn't have the concept of a process, but pretty much everybody has the concept of a process now. We'll talk about what a process is in a second. A process can be thought of as a unit of resource allocation and protection that manages resources and prevents threads and other processes from corrupting the resources that it manages. So a process is sort of this enclosure and there can be multiple threads running within it. So in this diagram, the process is sort of this grayish round angle thing and the threads are the little squiggly marks within that. The resources that are managed by a process include things like the processor cores, various types of files, typically files that are in secondary storage. There's memory, which is in primary storage. There's network connections from network adapters, network hardware, various synchronizers and so on. And these are all the resources that threads compete with, with other threads within a process. So those are the things that are accessed and have to be managed by the operating system. You can think of an operating system essentially as a, a resource manager in a way, and a process is one way of managing resources. So let's take a look at a little code snippet that illustrates how you could start threads. There's lots of different ways to do this. This is just for simplicity's sake. So here's an example where we're going to have a loop. This is a good old Java index-based for loop, and it's gonna loop for five iterations, and each time through, it's going to create a new thread. It's gonna give that thread some computation to run, and it's going to start the thread, which means the thread starts to run. And this particular environment will be running those computations in those five threads atop four processor cores. Now, you, you don't have to have a Java thread run on the same core throughout its life cycle. It can actually be multiplexed or time sliced across the different processors. So one of the threads, let's say the thread down here in the lower left-hand corner, might start out running on the first core here, and then after a while, it might suspend itself or be suspended automatically or whatnot. And then when it gets a chance to run again, it might run on the second core or the third core, or the fourth core, and so on. And this is what's typically talked about as multiplexing and time slicing. And I actually had fun coming up with a little image here using the Microsoft Bing AI generating image feature, which shows basically a clock with some knives to slice it up. So that's time slicing. That's the visualization of time slicing. You can also have multiple threads running on a single core processor. So you could actually have all these threads being multiplexed over a single core processor. So it's kind of like you in your everyday life where you're taking care of multiple things simultaneously. There's, there's one of you, but you might be doing multiple things. You might be talking to someone and texting and checking your email and whatever you do when you're, when you're time slicing yourself and multitasking. What's interesting to note, however, is that single core processors are becoming rare, especially for general purpose computing devices. It's very difficult to buy processors nowadays that only have a single core. You could probably still get them maybe if you're trying to do some kind of an embedded system where you're really trying to keep the cost down. But by and large, everything is multi-core. My, my phone has four cores. My laptop has 10 cores. So it's kind of like the 
the upside down airplane stamp. It's becoming increasingly rare to find these things without paying a fortune for them. Concurrent threads that are running can either, well, almost always interact with each other. We'll talk when we talk about parallelism how in a parallel system, usually the threads don't interact or they interact very, very, very infrequently. But in concurrent programs, threads typically interact. And they can interact with two key ways. They can interact either using something called shared objects, which are essentially synchronizers, and or by message passing. So we're going to talk about both of these techniques here. The concept of synchronizers or shared objects are commonly used for several things. One thing that they are used to do is to ensure mutual exclusion, to make sure that one thread is able to protect the resources it's ac accessing while other threads wait their turn to get a chance to do something with them. And so that's one form of thing that's kind of like a, like a restroom in an airplane where it's got a protocol for letting one person in at a time, so it's mutual exclusion. And then you also have the concept of coordination, which basically means taking turns accessing or running and coordinating with each other. We'll talk about other synchronizers here in just a bit. But the key point there is that there's ways of being able to coordinate and or ensure mutual exclusion between multiple threads to keep them from corrupting shared state. We won't spend a lot of time in this class talking about shared state, but shared state is the root of all evil in concurrent programs. And we'll talk about that briefly. A class I teach in other contexts talks about that a lot more. So another way to communicate is through message passing. And this allows multiple threads to interact by putting messages in so-called thread safe queues or sometimes blocking queues that are synchronized properly. And that typically involves using some of those synchronization objects we talked about. But the idea with message passing is they're pushing the synchronizers down below a nice facade that's a lot easier to program to and reason about because you're abstracting away from the low-level details of shared objects and synchronization. Unlike sequential programming and sequential programs, different executions of a concurrent program may produce different orderings of instructions. And this is by design. In some sense, it's also by necessity in other senses because that's kind of the whole point. Once you have multiple things starting to work, you don't always want to or have the ability to control the order in which they run. So let's take a quick look at some examples here. If you recall sequential programs, we talked about how the ordering of the instructions in the source code match the order in which things ran, at least logically, in terms of program meaning and program semantics. In contrast, concurrent programs don't behave like that intentionally. So the textual order of the source code in a concurrent program doesn't necessarily define the order of execution unless it just happens to accidentally run that way. So here's a very simple example where we have three different functions, computation A, computation B, computation C. And you can see we start three threads, each of which runs one of those computations. And there's really no guarantees that those computations will run in any particular order. Computation A could run first, or computation C could run first, or computation B could run first, and they can just run in any order that that happens to be uh, proved and enforced by the underlying operating system scheduler and the hardware that it's running on. Another thing that's different between sequential programming and concurrent programming is that operations are permitted to overlap in time across multiple cores. So if you've got computations that are running concurrently, you can have them running in different cores at the same time, and there'll be overlaps between those different execution sequences, rather than having things run sequentially, where one thing completed, at least logically, before the next thing began. And again, this is all by design. This is sort of part of the beauty and joy of concurrent programming. It also turns out to be one of the, the challenges of using concurrent programming is things aren't always occurring in the same order, which makes reasoning about your program more complicated, which means debugging your program can be more complicated, and so on and so forth. One of the other key themes in a concurrent program is trying to offload work from some threads and allow other threads to run concurrently. So a good example of this, by no means the only example, but a very common example, is having the user interface thread, that's the thread that's interacting with, with people like you and me, running in a different context than background threads. So for example, if you have a mobile device, then typically all the interactions you do on the touch screen is going to run in the so-called user interface thread or the UI thread, 
and then longer running computations will take place in background threads. Uh, Android is a good example of this, by the way, and, and iOS does the same kind of thing. So one of the main approaches, one of the main benefits of doing this is that background threads can block, for example, if they have to download a large file, or they might need to write something to a local file, or they might be waiting on some resource that's being shared, and so on and so forth. So background threads are capable of blocking. However, the user interface thread is not allowed to block for any length of time. And in fact, on Android, if you write a program that tries to have the main thread, the user interface thread block, usually you just simply can't do it. But if you try it, you'll get exceptions at runtime, which say application not responding, and you get these, these little dialog buttons that pop up, or little dialog boxes that pop up and say, do you want to terminate this task? It's running too long, so on and so forth. The other tricky part about concurrent programs, which is really not a case, not a situation or a problem whatsoever in sequential programs, is that any so-called mutable state that's shared between multiple threads must be protected to avoid concurrency hazards. So first, what is mutable state? Mutable state are fields or variables that can be shared between multiple threads that can be read to and or written from. So mutable means capable of being changed. So for example, in Java, you could have a static field or you could have a field that's part of some singleton or some object that has global scope within a context of a program with multiple threads. And if there's threads that are reading and writing to that state, then you have to make sure you protect it to avoid concurrency hazards. We'll talk more about concurrency hazards here in a separate lesson shortly, but a good example of a concurrency hazard would be a so-called race condition. And this can occur when a program only works depending on the sequence or the timing of the threads that are running. If they happen to run in a particular order, it works. If they don't happen to run in that order, then you'll end up with corruption, and that's typically called a race condition, when multiple things kind of smash into each other in memory and make changes that are not properly protected. And there's other, other subtle concurrency hazards we'll talk about later in a second. How do we avoid these problems? Well, this motivates the need for all kinds of Java synchronizers. So there's things like Java reentrant locks, which provide mutual exclusion. There are various types of atomic operations that you can use, which give you all or nothing computation. There's coordination mechanisms, such as the Java condition objects that allow threads to order where, when they run and the order in which they run and so on and the time at which they run. And then there's also something called barrier synchronizers that allow everybody to start at the same time, everybody to finish at the same time. We're not going to talk a heck of a lot about those things, but you can see more about them here if you read this link from the Oracle documentation on Java. Message passing can be used to avoid directly sharing state across multiple threads. So rather than trying to coordinate things through various types of locks or synchronizers, you can simply pass messages. And what this does is it combines a bunch of other stuff. So it basically pushes the synchronization into the object implementation. It also provides various guarantees with respect to memory visibility, when, when things are visible between threads. We'll talk more about that in a second. It often encourages you to pass immutable state so you don't have to worry about protecting it. And it encapsulates everything within nice object facades so that threads can interact with each other without sharing mutable state directly. And that reduces a lot of complexity of programming and reasoning about your programs. But of course, as with everything else, there's a cost that comes with the higher levels of abstraction. And we'll talk more about that later. So that's the end of the overview of concurrent programming concepts.